practical tool um, for donors, for election management bodies, and others to design programs to improve the quality of an election. And I think um, the first place that we decided to do this was Afghanistan. Um, you can assume there are positives and negatives to that. Um, <laughs> One positive was that we had an unbelievable amount of resources. We had a, whole, a great deal of textual data. We had observation reports. We've got um, uh, other implementers' reports and our own internal reports and, and incredible connections in the country to be able to do interviews and whatnot. So we had a, a great deal of, of, of resources to draw on. However, everything is so bad um, that ranking them and, and, and thinking of ways to address problems um, could be a bit overwhelming, and you could start to have many things starting to rank similarly, if that makes sense, um, which I will show you later. Um, we wanted to make sure that we designed a process that was flexible so that we could use it in many different country or contexts, and I think from this pilot project, we've probably been able to do that. Um, and uh, Stefan Darnoff was on this assessment in Kabul as well, um, and I think that uh, we found that uh, the reaction to it was very positive in country. Um, we'll see if it has any effect on the elections in 2014. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we make a distinction between fraud and malpractice, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and then also something that we didn't utilize for Afghanistan was looking at a specific problem area, say it's voter registration. And our methodology would allow you to also say how much time and money would it take to fix that problem. And donors obviously would be very interested in this. Voter registration is probably a bad one to say in Afghanistan because Unbelievable amounts of time and resources would be required to fix the situation in Afghanistan. But one thing that um, drives a lot of the work that we, we have done are, are the, uh, the definitions that we've used. I think they've been discussed a lot today. I think um, what we wanted to do was look at specific aspects of the election cycle, and then we categorize them as if they are systemic manipulation. By that we mean have the rules of the game been manipulated before the election ever takes place. For example, in Afghanistan, the president just decrees the election laws, and he decrees the appointment of the election commission. Now, that's nothing the election commission or others can, can affect. This is system, uh, systemic manipulation. And the people who actually can do something about that, who can apply pressure to that, are the international community. It's not the internal domestic stakeholders other than maybe NGOs and others applying grassroots pressure. So being able to identify a problem with the law um, as systemic manipulation and not something the election commission has done personally, um, allows you to design programs to deal with it. And when we were in a meeting with the deputy secretary, uh, the SRSG in Kabul, and I said to him, systemic manipulation, the legal framework is a problem you need to address. It's not something the election commission needs to address. He did not like that very much uh, because they didn't want to be accountable for any of these things. But it's something that this definition allows us to do. Now, malpractice, uh, we say this is a breach of duty of care, um, resulting in carelessness or neglect. And I think this raises the issue that, um, that was discussed earlier in regards to if there's a responsibility for the election commission to do something, if they purposely don't do it, if they just, then that's malpractice. It's a duty of care issue, which is the standard definition of a duty of care. Now, fraud, we have said, is an intentional wrongdoing of an election official or other election stakeholder, which distorts the individual or collective will of the voters. I want to clarify one thing. We, we definitely do not say that fraud is, is um, breaking the law. Um, th it could be, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be intentionally trying to manipulate the election. And I think in our first paper, we go through and outline that pretty specifically. Um, the process in which we work, and I'll try to go through this very quickly, is we conducted a very, very um, extensive desk study. And this desk study allowed us to identify likely er areas of vulnerability. Um, and then we were able to develop a team based on that death study of who should go to Kabul and do the work, what sort of interviews we should have, who we should talk to, what resources we need. Um, and then we went through our um, assessment topics in which we have developed very specific questions for each topic, which I will show you the, the areas uh, later. And then when we went into country, we met with stakeholders and asked specific questions. And then we scored their, our relative responses to specific questions on a scale between vulnerability and the likely impact on the election. And I'll show that to you later. Um, it was an, incre an incredibly arduous process, and it was about a 120-page document in the end. Um, the paper that you've seen is just a little bit of it. Um, now, one thing that, uh, that we definitely did is we tried to discuss a qualitative assessment um, of each category, and then we also assigned these scores. And on the qualitative assessment, if we were talking about media, for example, 
we would talk about the international public law standard, if there was one, that would apply to that topic. And then we would, through narrative, discuss if we believed that in Afghanistan this was being met. And then we also had the score, which I will show you in a minute. And we went through that on 15 areas. And this is, these are the 15 areas that we looked at specifically. Um, there are, in our assessment methodology, we have 20 areas that we could use. But due to the team security situation, a number of issues, and also what we thought was relevant in Afghanistan, we looked at these 15 issues. Now, what we did is, as I discussed, there are, there are 20 processes. And then under each 20 electoral process, um, there are two to six subcategories underneath it. And the way that we came up with these issues is we sent out these, these, category, these process categories to specific experts. IFAS is very fortunate to have a number of administrative election administration experts on staff. So if we were looking at voter registration, we've got a very solid bench to come up with questions for election, I mean, for voter registration, complaints adjudication, and other areas. And so we developed questions on that. Um, and then on each one of those areas, for example, on complaints adjudication, if we were looking at, we were looking to see if the court was, um, uh, was independent in their, in their decision-making process or not, we would rate a scale of if they were, if they were not, if, if, um, if the court were making decisions based on, on pressure or something else, is it vulnerability? What, did it open a vulnerability to fraud? And or if it were taken advantage, how much would the impact be on the election? I think the courts is probably a bad example to draw on. There's probably the counting process would probably be a better one in Afghanistan or the actual polling center operations. Now, in the paper, there's, we give you the scoring scale and it's outlined, but this, these are the basic criteria in which we, we looked at in regards to how we scored from zero to 10 on specific issues. Our death studies show that in 2009, um, there were 5.6 million uh, ballots cast. Um, there were 4.5 million or 4.6 million uh, ba ballots certified, which left about 1.3 million ballots um, kicked out, largely characterized as fraud. And the Election Complaints Commission um, held that it was ballot stuffing, stealing ballot boxes, misuse of government resources, threats of violence. And then um, observer reports were similar, um, but uh, manipulation of ballot box seals are a little more specific. And I think those are observers who know the process well. We're looking at specific problems. But these are the main, main issues that were described as to why ballots were rejected. They're pretty similar for 2010 in regards to what the narrative was in Afghanistan and the level of fraud that took place. And this narrative that has been played out in Afghanistan really focuses almost specifically and only on fraud. But I think it's a much more nuanced picture that we have to look at. And I'll, I'll give you one example. There was, a, there was an investigation trigger, they called it, in 2010, more than 20, uh, 2009, that if a ballot box had more than 90% of the ballots inside that ballot box were for one candidate, it was deemed to be fraudulent and thrown out. It was supposed to be a trigger, but in fact, many times they were used as evidence in and of themselves, and the ballot box was thrown out. Now, from a lawyer's perspective, <laughs> I think you need to find some corroborating evidence before you throw out an entire ballot box. Imagine in Washington, D.C., if there was a ballot box that had 90% of the votes for President Obama, and the Election Commission just threw them out because they were 90%. And, and in the District of Columbia, that's a very real possibility. And in Afghanistan, in some very specific regions, there probably very well could have been 90% of the ballots um, cast for Karzai. But these triggers were used in and of themselves. And then, then observers, media, everyone else picked this up as fraud. And they blamed it squarely on the election commission. Now, maybe they were fraud. We don't know. Likely, a lot of it was fraud. But I think there should have been more done to investigate and to see what was really happening before those ballots were thrown out and those voters disenfranchised. Now, I think that um, another thing that we identified through our assessment was there's an obsession with blaming the election commission for fraud. And in many instances, it's probably proper. But in Afghanistan, there's a, there's a whole army of people who are involved uh, in defrauding the system. There's the executive interference, as I talked about, systemic manipulation. There's also unbelievable amounts of negligence from the lower level, precinct level um, poll workers. There was recruiting problems, training problems. You can go on for a long time. And so people were making actual mistakes when they were tallying 
um, tally sheets, and they weren't purposely trying to defraud the system, and yet all we talked about was fraud. Again, I don't want to undermine that there was fraud, but it wasn't the only thing involved. Also, the abuse of administrative um, resources and the role of militias in the process. So very quickly, um, this is when we, score, when we score these areas, this is what the chart can start to look like. And what we're trying to do is, is rank these areas in comparison to one another, once we've decided if they were fraud, malpractice, or systemic manipulation. And one thing that we need to be clear about is there could be counting problems that are both fraudulent and malpractice. So they can reside in both areas. You can't just neatly put something in one and not in the other. Um, but in voting operations, this would be ballot stuffing. This is actually people stuffing the ballots. And in counting would be manipulating the, the actual tally sheets and other things. Now you can also get into voter registration, um, which many opposition parties see as the biggest issue or the biggest problem in Afghanistan because there's a charge of people using voter ID cards um, to, to, multi to vote multiple times. But our interviews on the ground seem to indicate maybe somebody could vote one or two times. Maybe they could get the ink on their finger, then go home and scrub it really hard, and then come back. Maybe they could do it two or three times in a day. But the real, in Afghanistan, with most people that we interviewed, that wasn't the, the real source of fraud. It was just stuffing the ballot boxes. But this is an area that opposition parties definitely use and are will use in 2014 to describe a problem. And it is a real problem, but it's not the only problem. Also, there's a role of security forces involved. Um, now on malpractice, you can kind of go through this and see that it's um, uh, pretty obvious. The training was a problem. The institutional framework in, in Afghanistan is a problem. Um, one thing I'll talk to about is the adjudication of grievances. The Election Complaints Commission in Afghanistan has to set up from zero um, with 120 days. With, from 120 days, they have to set up an entire court system. They have to find an office, buy the furniture, recruit staff, train them, and hear cases all within 120 days. And you can only assume there will be mistakes made. Um, and then finally, systemic manipulation, which we talked about, the legal framework, uh, and also delimitation. There has been no delimitation because there hasn't been a census done in Afghanistan. But there's talk about moving from an SNTV system to a first-past-the-post system in Afghanistan. If that happens, delimitation has become a huge issue. Um, and how they do that's going to be very important. How much time do I have? Done. OK. I'm out of time. Um, we, in our paper, we go through a, a, um, recommendations based on these distinctions between fraud, and malpractice, <coughs> and systemic manipulation. And the Election Commission and the UNDP-elect project is already starting to implement many of them. Um, but the most important thing would be a fraud control plan, which you can monitor and ensure the Election Commission is actually implementing it. Um, so with a limited amount of time, uh, I will conclude with that. Thanks. <laughs>